Hey guys, it's Miko from Ammo Sound Lab, and this is very likely one of the most important tutorials for getting a good professional mix that I've ever made, and this is all about how to process your drums. Um, there are different methods for doing this, but I believe my method is likely the correct one. It follows a principle that essentially we follow for guitar tones as well. It's all about getting the source tone correct. So if you get some of our IRs, they are raw samples. We haven't in any way or form EQ'd them. They are just very high quality captures of the raw sound that I get from the cabinets. Same goes for the amped plugins. So the same reason why the amp sims sound so good is that I've really not messed with them at all. That's the natural sound of the amplifier and I'm just giving that to you. Now the same thing applies to ML drums obviously. Um, the samples are as raw as possible. Obviously mic pre's and things like that do affect things and mic choices and so on, but that is something that's a part of everything. Now, how do you process these uh, raw samples to get the most out of them? Um, it's a combination of EQ, compression, saturation, uh, but mainly volume balance. And that is something that I want to talk about the most right now. This setup that I have going on right here is uh, essentially the Lux kit. So we have the vintage toms and the vintageness really, uh, we can actually switch to condenser mic. So if you're using the dynamic mics, that's a vintage 421 mic and uh, that will give you um, a more vintage sound while the condenser mics will give you more attack and now you have a more modern sound. So that's the first tweak you can do even with the microphones. Um, same goes for the kick. Now I love to use the B91A, you'll likely guess which microphone that is based on. Um, obviously the industry standard is the B52A but this mic is very much mix ready and you rarely have to do anything to make it work. So um, I highly recommend leaning towards this microphone. Now what is new with the 2.0 update for ML drums is that we now can control the top and bottom microphones for the snare. So uh, you can actually choose to just have uh, the top microphone or you can choose to have just the bottom microphone <laughs> and obviously the good perfect blend is something we design quite um, uh, extensively so having them both on zero is maximizing the punch and uh, clarity for the snare so you can trust that pretty much dead on just have them both at zero should be good to go you can process it further to get different uh, sounds out of it. So what we have right now in the mixer uh, is that we're not using any of the saturation, we're not using any of the compression, we're not using any of the EQ. So you are currently hearing these samples raw as they were recorded. Now this is something that you don't really get elsewhere. Many times uh, these samples are pre-processed quite heavily and sort of the sound has been decided beforehand. Now you may have seen some ML drums demos and you likely uh, were surprised that it always sounds different no matter who's using it and this is exactly the point. If you don't have anything going on in the mixer, you actually just have the raw samples and you can do so many things to them. Let's have a listen to this drum track with just the raw samples here. Now, it doesn't sound bad at all, and that is the entire point I'm trying to make here. The samples are extremely high quality. Sure, this is full velocity hitting the snare. <clears throat> That's not the most amount of punch that you've ever heard in your life. So, um, there are things that you can do to the snare. And believe me, the snare and kick will be the most important part of your drum mixing. So, let's just jump straight into it. So the tools that we have right here are uh, saturation, compression, EQ, 
and the amount of bleed that you get into the um, overhead and room tracks and reverb. So um, what we're actually going to be doing is not soloing the closed microphones because, you know, the closed microphones are not the entire sound. I think too many people mainly just concentrate on, for example, in this case, I would just solo the kick and just listen to this and get this one sound sounding good, this one close mic, when in reality um, you are always going to be hearing the kick through the overhead and room and and that will be your entire sound. So don't concentrate too heavily on just the close microphones and that is especially true in the case of the snare track. So what you can already tell is if I solo the kick track, it sounds like this. But the reality is, when you have the overhead and room tracks on, what you're actually hearing is this. So if you are super focused on just that close mic, you will most likely be wasting a lot of time trying to make that close mic sound perfect, when in reality you should be focusing on the entire sound of the kit. Now obviously, the first thing I recommend you do is control how much of the room and overhead sound you want to hear for the kick. So let's have a listen to that. So when you dial in the overhead for the kick, you will be also hearing the resonance from the snare. Um, I don't personally love that sound, but it's what makes everything sound realistic. So you want to have some of that in, but overall it shouldn't be too prominent if you want to get a really punchy kick. And in the case of the room, uh, that is what gives me at least a feeling of a huge impact. So I want to have some of that room in there. Um, so already the difference we're making by adjusting the volume of the overheads and the room, it's quite big. How you would use compression, saturation, EQ on a kick, it depends a little bit on the use case. Uh, I like the sound of this kick. I don't really hear anything wrong with it. Uh, I can try and see if I can make it better, but overall, if something sounds good, don't immediately jump to some EQ setting that you saw your favorite engineer or your favorite guitar player <laughs> do on a YouTube video that one time. Um, use your ears and uh, there's nothing wrong with the raw samples here. So right now we're hearing raw samples of the kick, room, overheads, and it sounds good. So don't mess with it. If anything, you can destroy the sound by doing something with the EQ you shouldn't be doing. Um, I would use the EQ more for balancing purposes. Now, um, why would you use a compressor? I personally use compressors for punch uh, and character. And this compressor section is pretty much like a 1176 type compressor. Uh, I personally have the release pretty much full on, especially for the kick, many times for the snare as well. Uh, now, if the time for your attack is too long, uh, you will sort of be cutting the tail of the kick, but the kick isn't that long to begin with here. So many times if you have the attack too long, you're not really actually doing anything to the sound. So if you want to add character, you actually want to have the attack quite uh, low, meaning as short as possible. So uh, let's start pushing the threshold here and see what happens. And it's lower in the volume, so you're going to be starting to hear the overhead and room track more. Let's solo the single track, even though I just said never to do this, uh, just so we can hear what the compressor is doing. Okay, I think about 12 o'clock is where we sort of optimize the compressor to be, where it does just enough. <laughs> now let's play around with the attack.
So I would say if the attack is higher than 30 milliseconds, higher than 40 milliseconds, it starts to become very unnoticeable th that the compressor is doing anything because, you know, the attack is going to be waiting for when it starts to adjust the volume. So if the length of the kick is, for example, 40 milliseconds, which could be the case, this is already missing the entire kick, so the compressor is actually not doing anything. So if you do want to kind of have an influence on the kick sample itself, the attack needs to be quite fast. And um, many times, re remember when you're using like a, a plugin that has attack on it, it's not accurate and <laughs> the milliseconds that they tell on those, especially those analog compressors. So uh, once again, don't copy some settings you saw somewhere, use your ears. This is very much uh, true to the values that this compressor is giving you. So even um, if you have this on minimum, um, uh, well, let's have a listen to what it sounds like. So um, if it's too low, then it's eating the entire kick. If it's too high, like 40 milliseconds, it's not doing anything. So what you want to be listening to right here is you want to get the most snap, but you still want to hear some low end. If you go too short, you're not actually even hearing the impact of the kick. So I would say rather not use the compressor if you don't know what you're doing, rather than have it on with wrong settings. So let's just fine tune this. It's very subtle. Um, I could argue that with having the threshold fully off, meaning that the compressor is not even on, it potentially even sounds better. There's nothing wrong with the natural uh, snap and boom of the kick sample we made. But having some of this compression on does actually make the kicks more even with each other. So for that reason, I do use this quite a bit, but these settings are not really heavily influencing the tone. It's more just evening out the kick. Now, saturation with the kick, you need to be careful with this. If you completely distort your kick, you will likely lose the impact once again. So remember, these are all kind of affecting the punch of the kick. So if you want to get an even impact from the compressor with the settings we just made, uh, you want to use the saturation uh, to add more cut to the kick. But it's similar to, for example, guitar amp distortion. Uh, if you have too much distortion, you're going to be losing your pick attack. Same thing here. If you have too much saturation, you will lose the attack of your kick. So you need to be very careful with this setting. Now, even that setting is actually quite high. Um, just to be clear, a setting of 1 dB is realistic console saturation. Now, obviously, back in the day, people would run um, the signal through many things. So you would be doubling uh, the amount of saturation you're getting from analog devices. Um, so if you have it on eight, it's like running your signal through eight different things that all add some saturation to it. Um, so this is actually quite a high setting already, uh, but I feel like with having it on eight, we got a fatter sound, we still have the impact. Now let's have a listen to what it sounds like with the room and overhead tracks now. Um, you may not be hearing the sub that I'm hearing. I actually have a sub here in the room and I have 
this Neumann DSP kind of a setup so I can hear this quite clearly. Please use some headphones if you're not really hearing what I'm tweaking here. But that is pretty good. I wouldn't necessarily do anything more to it. Now you can add some highs to your kick if you want to. So what I did there was I actually added some highs, cut some mids, and added a little bit of lows. But ultimately, these are settings that I would never recommend you to tweak when you're listening to just one thing. So please leave the EQ section to when you're actually listening to the full kit. Uh, essentially, what I really try to tell people to do is to try and match the clarity of the kick and snare so they sound like they're from the same family or same kit. If you have a super dark kick and a super bright snare, it just sounds weird. You kind of want to have them be similar and it's more pleasant to listen to. The most important thing in my opinion <laughs> is the snare. So let's start doing the same thing for the snare. Let's have a listen to just the close mics and then how much of the room and overheads we want to bring in. Okay, one thing to point out is that on the room track, we actually do have compression on. So that is something that I do by default. Um, I just have essentially attack on minimum, release on maximum uh, compression pretty much in the dead center position. That is the threshold, sorry, I mean. Um, anyways, uh, what I heard with these was that having more of the overheads of the snare in there, it's actually going to be making your snare more stereo, which is a bad thing because uh, the punch comes from the kick and snare. If your snare is stereo, uh, it's not going to get an even distribution. You want to have your snare main punch dead center panned. So you don't want to have the overhead too high for that reason. And maybe I'm not a huge fan of the stereo snare sound either. I mean, I could argue that it sounds better with having none of the overhead in there, but it sounds very unrealistic. And that is where you start to sound like you're using a sampler when in reality, you can make this sound just like a real drummer. Uh, now the room track, this is a fashion that I'm sure my very good friends from GGD, uh, the periphery guys made famous. Um, most of your snare sound these days just comes from the room tracks. If I just mute the close mics, you'll hear how much of the sound is actually not even coming from the close microphones. That doesn't have the close mics in. <laughs> okay. I potentially have the close mics too low in the mix, so I'm just gonna dial down the room a little bit here. So now you're getting a better understanding of what I said before uh, re in regards to not really paying too much attention to the close mics for the kick and snare because most of the sound is not even on the close mic. That's just a room and overhead. And this is the close mic. So you're using the close mic to get the punch uh, pan dead center and you're getting the sustain and everything amazing sounding from the overhead and room tracks. So this doesn't actually even have to sound that great. <laughs> you know, the, the focus of the close mic can be just to get 
the the most aggression out of this sound and that is exactly what i use it for i i have no problem with having the compressor being puppy where it really almost explodes like a transient designer and with the saturation i can make it even more sharp sounding you know it's not going to be a problem because it's just a small portion of the entire snare sound that is coming out of this track let's jump into the compressor and my settings tend to be uh, I think I, I still have the release pretty much full on, but this attack, uh, he, this is where I do things a little bit differently. I want to have this quite low, like 10 milliseconds, because I do want to control the snap of the snare quite a bit and the sustain of the snare as well. So uh, this is actually matched with uh, the Wave CLA 76 uh, snare settings that I used back in the day. So 10 milliseconds attack on the snare and 500 for the release and you can go crazy with the threshold, it will sound quite natural. So let's have a listen to that. So what it's actually doing, it's um, gonna just leave you with the pop, the attack of the snare. Um, you want to potentially dial that back a little bit because you do want to get uh, more of the actual sound of the body of the drum as well, not just the attack. So um, try and find a good balance for, for um, the sound that you're trying to get here. The body is here, the pop and attack is there. I felt like around 18, that is that is where I have a very good balance for this particular snare drum where I get the smack and attack and I also get the body. Now saturation is very important for the snare. Uh, the amount of it you have can be the difference between uh, Paramore snare, uh, essentially the Riot snare that is just full on saturation. And in my opinion, that, that sound is almost like uh, leaning more heavily towards the pop of of this compressor so so to get that kind of a super uber punchy sound you would actually just concentrate on getting the pop from the compressor that kind of an aggression and then you would boost the saturation and try and get the body back in to the snare with the saturation let's have a listen to that And right now, with all these crazy things I'm doing here, I feel like I have too much of the bottom microphone coming through. So now I would lower the bottom of the snare mics. So that is a very extreme attack sound for your snare. I uh, would not use this for um, uh, John Mayer or something like that, smoother music. Um, let's dial back kind of the punch of the compressor and find a good setting for the saturation. I didn't feel like I needed much to get that amazing punch and attack and aggression for the snare. Now these are the kinds of settings, the saturation setting especially, that you would tweak and fine-tune once you hear the full kit and um, with the snare um, and the EQ many times I don't touch it at all but uh, in order to get the snare to cut a little bit better I many times use the default settings that are here so that's 6k with a Q of 1 and I will kind of find just a little bit more clarity for the snare especially when it's low tuned like it is in this demonstration so I didn't feel like it made a big difference, so I'm not going to boost it because it's, once again, more likely that I'm just going to screw it up 
by doing something that I'm not hearing in the context of the mix. Now, in the case of toms, I actually try and make them sound very similar to the kick. So much of the processing that I'm doing, I many times sort of copy and then fine tune. Uh, I try and make them seem like they're coming from the same place. So the processing is, is many times going to be identical on them. Uh, once again, not really going too deep into uh, any of the EQ and stuff. Uh, we can do the room fine tuning as well. Now, for toms, I many times like to have more of the overhead in there because it doesn't have to be panned dead center. Um, and that actually makes it sound a lot more natural. While panning toms many times sounds very unnatural. For example, here we have a floor tom panned to the right side. Um, getting a lot of low frequencies to the side can sound very weird. So having some more of it in the overheads actually helps with this, I find. Let's fine tune the threshold for the tom here. And actually I'm gonna get some dynamics in here. I'm not really doing much with the compressor. I could potentially have it completely off uh, for the toms. At this point, usually it's very important to get the volume balance right. So uh, the fundamentals are here, kick and snare essentially. And that is all I really recommend you concentrate on at first. Let's have a listen to the entire track that we have here. Okay, um, critical listening there. There's too much lows on the kick. The snare is too low in the mix. The hi-hat is too loud. Um, so let's start adjusting. Too much lows in the kick. Okay, so at first I just uh, wanted to fine tune the overall volume. Many times if you're hearing too much low end on the kick, well, it's mostly low end, so it could be just volume. So I lowered the volume until I felt like the high end was where it needed to be, uh, matching the snare somewhat, and then uh, just cutting 2 dB from the low. So uh, the adjustment wasn't actually that big. It was more about the volume. So we did actually lower the low end uh, four and a half dB, but we also lowered the high end two and a half dB. So um, you didn't actually have to mess with the EQ that much. I, I feel like right now it's sitting pretty good. Uh, now, snare is too low in the mix. There are a couple of things I can do here. Uh, let's try them out. First one is volume. And that is actually pretty good. That is actually pretty good. But there's one thing that is much more interesting, which is uh, saturation. This is where we can actually use saturation to get more cuts for the snare. And we don't actually have to boost the volume that much. So um, just to be clear, what I'm listening to right now is I want to hear the low end of the snare and I want to hear it punch 
just right. So I'm actually listening to the kick low end and the snare low end. I want to try and match those two. Somewhere around there. But I want to get more cut for the snare. So now I'm going to touch the saturation. Okay, so a lot of fine tuning there. Uh, when I boost the highs too much, I start to hear uh, the low mic and the, the snares underneath. You know, the snares underneath the snare drum. <laughs> so I don't want to hear those too loud in the mix. That just kind of gives away uh, that you have a lot of compression going on and it actually takes away from the punch. So um, I didn't want to do too much of a high boost. Um, and um, I just added a little bit of saturation more uh, to kind of compensate for it. So now if we would be listening to just the close snare track, it probably sounds completely different to what we would have tweaked before. It sounds like there's too much saturation. I hear the snares way too well on this close mic, but remember that even when you mute the close mic of the snare, there's that much snare going on anyway. So it's a combination of all those tracks, the snare bleed from the overheads and the room. Okay, I'm, I'm having some problems getting the volume balance right. And I think the problem is that the overhead channel itself is too loud. So let's just adjust that. Okay, so what I was actually doing there was trying to um, optimize uh, the punch of the crash symbol there and how long it sustains. Uh, I, I'm using the saturation to add sustain essentially in this instance. So I felt like having it at 4 dB, um, the symbols ring out just the right amount in comparison to the kick and snare. Um, right now, I don't have the hi-hat track on at all. Um, but I can control how much of the hi-hat you will be hearing through the overhead. And ultimately, if I want to be using this track, it needs to be a little bit lower in the overheads. So let's have a listen to that.
okay, I did many things there that I didn't really explain. Um, overall, if you think about drums in real life, the hi-hat is super loud in comparison to many things. Uh, one of the most important drums in the kits. Um, so it's got to be super loud in the room, in the overheads, in real life, this happens all the time. Um, if you want to use the close mic for the hi-hat, which in my opinion is not always necessary, but it adds kind of a constant uh, sound, especially for um, these verse portions where you really want to hear the articulate things that you're doing with the, with the hi-hat. So um, for that reason, I want to have it lower in the overheads and room so I can actually use this track. If I have it too loud in these tracks in the overhead and room, then I really can't use this too much. This is also something that happens in real life. We don't have ride in this track, so um, I just matched the settings. Uh, I would process them quite similarly many times, but obviously the volume of the ride is different, so you would duplicate this process for the ride as well. Um, now, um, uh, let's continue listening to the full kit after this, because we really don't have any closed mics left. Um, uh, remember that we just change the volume of the overheads with 5 dB and we already uh, adjusted uh, the amount of bleed that we want to have of the snare for example uh, now we would actually have to readjust so let's jump back uh, to where we had just the snare And it would seem that the smart Miko guy has done this before because having the settings on noon is where it sounds best. Uh, let's do the same for the kick. Something like that. Um, uh, the room is still on the same volume. Potentially you could fine tune that, but what you're actually hearing in the room right now it's actually something we could actually take a listen to. And unsurprisingly, it sounds just like having some amazing room mics in an amazing drum room and a really good drummer drumming. I could potentially lower uh, the symbols from the room track and the way you would do it is just lower this room uh, control here. I don't know what to say, that sounds really good. And just by the, uh, using the default settings and fine tuning them a little bit. Now you could add some saturation to the room track. And you could do the same for the overheads as we did before. Uh, also good to listen to the overhead track soloed, uh, just so that it sounds natural. And it sounds really good. I, I was just fine tuning the amount of snare that you would actually hear in the room. It's unrealistic that the snare is, for example, uh, lower in volume than any of the other things. It usually is still the loudest thing on the kit, uh, even on the overhead tracks. So um, 
I think everything sounds very natural. And if you have a look at what we did with EQ, we just boosted 2 dB of the highs on the snare and lowered 2 dB of the lows on the kick. And other than that, we're listening to the raw samples. Um, we use saturation to add some cuts, but overall, this is as simple as it gets. So like I said in the beginning of this video, it's all about getting the source sound correctly. Uh, very good sounds, you just volume balance them and what you get is something amazing. Let's have a listen to the entire track with the instruments and see if we feel like we want to adjust this even further. Let's do it again. I, I lowered the hi-hat a little bit, uh, removed some of the saturation on the overheads. I felt like some of the cymbals were ringing out too long. Um, just minor adjustments here. That is so mix ready. I, I wouldn't really do much to it. We have reverb in here and we actually, I believe, we're not using any of it. Um, we could do something. Let's have a listen to the snare. Um, snare. I said snare. And what you can do is you can send uh, the direct signal of the, of the close mics uh, to the reverb and it sounds like this sort of like an old school metalcore thing like kill switch engage a much more pro and real way of doing it is actually to send some of the room track into the reverb so you can actually make the room appear even larger than it is very subtle but like I said it just makes this kind of the room seem even bigger than it actually is and um, one thing that I suppose I could demonstrate here is the parallel compression so um, if you're completely new and scared of what parallel compression is it's just uh, something that you can do where you have a compressed sound and a non-compressed sound that you can blend between so what it means is that we have a compressor here on the master bus that you can completely destroy and make sound like something you wouldn't use, but you can blend that in with the completely dry signal and get sort of a more interesting sound. So it's a different way of doing compression. Um, let's start by completely destroying this track with compression. <laughs> okay, release. Let's have the attack at 10. Okay, let's hear uh, this track with the instruments. And 
that's actually pretty cool. So uh, we are mainly using the dry track still, but we're blending in some of that overly compressed signal that I just made. And remember, those are my secret 1176 settings. 10 milliseconds on the attack, 500 on the release. Um, let's have a listen to the difference between having this completely dry and then adding in some of the over compression, so to say. Sounds so good. And what that actually does, it, it makes everything seem like they're one instrument. So they're all going through this same processing. That is subtle, but still everything is getting influenced with this compressor. And there's this uh, kind of a very pleasant pump going on right now. That's it. Have fun with ML drums and don't be afraid of the mixer section. Um, this is not that kind of a program where the first thing you do is you run multi outs and never touch this mixer page. This mixer page is top notch, high quality effects. You can trust it. It's likely even better than some of the plugins that you're using right now. Thank you so much for watching the video. It's been a long one. If you made it through here, thank you so much for liking these videos. Um, I love geeking out over this stuff. If you have suggestions for other things that I should do, please leave a comment down below and see you on the next one. And go check out ML Drums free. Yes, there's a free version and all this mixer functionality is in there. Have fun trying out all the cool stuff I showed today. Thank you and see you later. Bye bye.